All right. Good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> Thank you all so much for coming out and joining us on this uh, rather gloomy day. Um, I really appreciate you all braving the rain um, to come and hear from Mackenzie Pizio, who is the curator of this fabulous exhibit around you, um, Trailblazers, 150 Years of Alachua County Women. Um, for those of you joining us on Zoom today, you can also see the exhibit. There is a digital version available on our website, mathesonmuseum.org. Um, so I encourage you to check that out if you haven't already. Um, we were so fortunate that Mackenzie reached out to us. It was over two years ago now, um, looking for some sort of internship project. And you know, her area of interest was women's history. And I said, well, you know what our next exhibit is? Do you want to do that? And she just did such a fabulous job. Um, I'm so impressed and proud of the work that Mackenzie put into this. I know she hates me saying these things, um, but I'm going to say them anyways because she deserves them. Uh, so uh, without much further ado, I just want to thank our sponsors. Um, we are really fortunate to have funding from Visit Gainesville, Alachua County to support our exhibits and programs. And we are also uh, made possible by our members and donors. Um, so if you like what you see today and would like to see more of it, I encourage you to consider becoming a member of the museum if you aren't already. And uh, without any further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Mackenzie. All right, um, I have not spoken into a microphone before, so this is very exciting. Um, so like Caitlin said, uh, my name is Mackenzie Pizio. Um, I created this exhibit um, a couple years ago now. Um, so it feels sort of like a distant memory. So it's exciting to get to come back here today and talk to you all about it. Um, but first I wanna thank you all for coming here today. Um, you didn't have to. Uh, there are many other ways to spend your time. So you are fogging up. Um, so thank you for coming in the first place. Um, the kind of heart and soul of this exhibit is community. Um, if you look kind of anywhere in this exhibit, every woman is involved in something different, but they were bolstered by their community. Um, and I appreciate you all coming out today and sort of being a continuation of that community that was felt when all of these women were alive as well. Um, and secondly, I want to thank Caitlin, like she thanked me uh, for giving me this opportunity in the first place. Um, I, before this, did not have any experience in museums or making exhibits. So it does seem like a sort of crazy idea to give me free reign of making an exhibit. Um, so she definitely took a chance, um, but it is a chance that I continue to appreciate. Um, so when I began researching this exhibit, it started with about a hundred women on a list of, you know, online, on paper, just really any woman that I could find. Um, some that I could find only one mention of in an article from who knows when, um, or women like you see here today that had a wide breadth of information and artifacts and photographs. Um, that it really completely ranged. Um, but when I created this exhibit in the first place, I didn't really have a knowledge of Alachua County. Um, I'd gone here for your undergrad. That was really it. Um, my life revolved around the university and I didn't really branch out of that. So when I got to meet all of these women and see how they impacted this county, it gave me this entirely new appreciation for this area um, and the women that helped it become what it is today. Um, and to kind of continue on, on the research of this exhibit, like I said, there were a hundred women. There are obviously not a hundred women on these walls today. Um, and that is because in part, I couldn't tell their stories. Um, these walls are only so big. I kind of had to scale it down a little bit. I don't think you all want to read a hundred women's stories, kind of takes a while. Um, but in addition to that, there were a lot of women whose stories I just couldn't find. Um, there were a lot of women whose names were listed as Mrs. Insert husband name. 
Um, and there were a lot of women who were completely nameless, um, were just she or her. Um, and that is sort of the story of how this exhibit came to be. There were so many women who were secrets to history um, that I am still trying to figure out today. Um, and of course that is not unique to Alachua County, but it is something that I, I want to acknowledge before I talk about these women because as amazing as they all are and as proud as I am of each of them, um, I do feel like I need to acknowledge all the women who couldn't be up here uh, because of their circumstances being, being women. Um, unfortunately, that is a circumstance. <laughs> um, and I just wanna acknowledge all the women that couldn't be here because no one thought to remember them. No one thought to keep their stories safe. Um, and so I wanna encourage you all to kind of continue the work of this exhibit after you leave here today of keeping stories alive and keeping women's stories alive because they can be easily forgotten or left behind. Um, and so sort of the remainder of this will be sort of a guided walk around the exhibit. Um, there is a lot of information in this exhibit, um, but there's just as much information that didn't make it onto the wall. So kind of going to be a combination of stuff you can see, stuff that was left out, sort of like exclusive behind the scenes stuff. Um, so I'm going to get started. Let me put my glasses on so I can see again. All right, so we are going to start, of course, with Sarah Matheson. We are in the Matheson Museum. It makes sense to start with the namesake of the museum and the reason that this building and this exhibit really exists in the first place. So like many of the other women in this exhibit, Sarah's life was dedicated to service. Um, she married Christopher Matheson, who was a Gainesville native um, in North Carolina in 1933, and they remained married until his passing in 1952. When they moved to Gainesville in 1945, um, they moved into the Matheson house, which is also here on the property in 1946. Following his death and also during their life together, she worked as a missionary throughout the world, um, traveling to places like Korea, the Philippines, Burma, Pakistan, India, Israel, Italy, Greece, Denmark, China, uh, which you can see in her passport here. Um, it really is this amazing guide to her life through her travels. Yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah, the microphone helps. Um, but she traveled the world to all of these amazing places. Um, and her impact was not just through her ministry. Um, it was through just who she was. Um, what you'll see in if you look into her life through letters, there are numerous children from these countries that even referred to her as mother or mom. Um, that's how intensely her impact was felt in these areas that she maybe only spent a little over uh, two months in. Um, she made her impact felt very quickly. Um, and she even went so far as to sort of pseudo adopt two young Korean boys um, when they came here to the United States, offering them housing, um, English lessons, things like that, so that they felt like they had a home here in the United States, um, so far away from where they came from. Um, and then uh, this was not included in the exhibit, but um, March 12th, 1994, so just a couple weeks ago, is actually Sarah Matheson Day. Um, it's the day that the museum was uh, dedicated to her and to her memory. Um, so again, this history is living on, um, including with Sarah Matheson, not just in the fact that, you know, the museum is named after her, but, you know, there is a day every single year where we remember her contributions to Gainesville and to the world at large. All right, so we're gonna move on to our next woman, which is Mary Etta Hancock Coverly. Um, so she began teaching in 1886 when she was just 16 years old in a one room log cabin here in Archer, Florida. Um, she moved to Gainesville around 1909. Um, the date is a little fuzzy again, 
information on women, uh, especially in that era, is very hard to find and kind of narrow down. Um, but she moved to Gainesville with her husband, Frederick Coverley, um, and their two children, Helen and Hazel. She became the first woman principal in Alachua County around 1891 um, and was also a key figure in the creation of the Alachua County General Hospital. Um, and she helped secure the land that that hospital sits on. She was also a proud supporter of the Chautauqua movement, which encouraged adults with limited access to secondary education to continue their learning, both academically and socially. Um, and this building actually used to be the tabernacle of Florida, where many of those Chautauqua movement meetings took place. So those were not just contained to, to sort of educational um, sessions, but those were also uh, social meetings. They would play games. They would talk to each other and use the knowledge that they had been gaining from these classes and build a sort of community out of that. Um, so Marietta was someone that, again, was dedicated to educating her community in any way that she could, whether that be as a literal teacher in a school or as sort of a societal teacher and someone that brought people together to learn. So continuing that sort of educational theme, we have Maggie Tebow. Um, so Maggie, along with her sister and mother, um, actually volunteered at a hospital in Augusta during the Civil War, uh, visiting wounded soldiers and just speaking with them. They weren't trained in anything medical, but you know, just speaking to people, reading to them and helping them in any way that they could. Um, she comes from a long, long line of education-minded women, um, including her mother, who moved to Gainesville in 1867 to open her own private school here. Um, and prior to opening her own boarding school, she worked as a teacher at the former St. Mary's Priory on Amelia Island um, until, again, she opened her own school here, which was known as Miss Tebow's Boarding and Day School. And that school opened in 1873 and was sort of known among the diocese as the boarding school in Gainesville. Um, so it was kind of a hot spot of Catholic learning. <laughs> and it was recognized by the Protestant Episcopal Church Diocese of Florida and was named the official diocese and school for girls in 1908. Um, she dedicated her life to the education of young boys and girls. Um, it was kind of this new idea to teach both boys and girls in the same kind of spaces. Um, granted, there were only girls that were allowed to live in the boarding school, but they were educated together. And she was described as a faithful, consci conscientious teacher who worked earnestly to improve her pupils physically, mentally, and morally. And now to Emmelyn Buholtz, who's sitting right over here. Um, so she was the first president of the Florida Federation of Art and the co-founder of the Gainesville Association of Fine Art. She was often the sole exhibitor in many galleries and showed many paintings featuring the Florida landscape and its people. She taught at the Women's College of South Carolina and was supervisor of art in Shreveport, Louisiana public schools. Of the women featured in the exhibit, Emmeline has the least information known about her, including what she looked like. Despite her marriage to Frederick Buholtz, the namesake of a high school that sits a mere six miles from where we are now. Her story is not unique, unfortunately. Um, and while it may seem surprising that she is in an exhibit, despite having very little information about her, um, I, felt strongly that it was important that she be included as a sort of representation, not just of her life, but the lives of so many other women who did not get their stories told and their stories are sort of contained to the stories of their husbands. Um, and even <laughs> granted with her husband's uh, fame in this area, she isn't really a part of his story either. Um, and so I wanted to kind of keep that as a reminder in this exhibit that while it is important to remember these other women's stories. We also have to remember the women whose stories we don't know. And now to Daphne. Um, so Daphne Duval Williams was a three-time graduate of Florida A&M University. Um, she graduated from high school there in 1924. In 1927, she gained a bachelor's of science in mathematics and a master's of education in 1959. 
She was the first black woman to enroll at the University of Florida in the College of Education in their master's program here. Her goal in enrolling, she said, was to prove that black students had just as much gray matter as the white students. She was an educated for, educator for most of her life at Lincoln High School here in Gainesville, where she taught math for over 40 years and also served as an assistant principal. She was a co-founder of the Visionaries, an organization dedicated to improving the lives of African-Americans in Gainesville. Their work included helping register voters, holding academic workshops, health assistance, and donating to local and national organizations with similar missions. Um, one of the most interesting parts of Daphne's life and of my research of her life was finding the Visionary Scrapbook, which is located in the University of Florida's uh, Smathers Collection. It is one of the most amazing pieces I've ever seen, not just because it has a great deal of information in it, but because it was handmade. And I think that is representative of a lot of what is so important about this exhibit is people being able to create their own narratives, um, especially for black women who, you know, have so much of their narrative taken from them to create these scrapbooks is an important part of their journey as well as ours today um, to be able to create narratives that will shape how we are remembered in the future. Um, she is also, interestingly, a cousin of George Stark, the first Black student admitted to the U University of Florida. She was also active in the Mount Carmel, Carmel Baptist Church, a hotspot of civil rights activism in the 1960s and 70s. Now we're going to Judith Brown here in the middle. Um, so Judith Brown was an activist based in Gainesville and dedicated her life to liberation and equality for all. She wrote toward a women's a female liberation movement while she was still a student at the University of Florida um, alongside Beverly Jones, who was one of the wives of her professors and one of the co-founders of the Gainesville Women for Equal Rights. This um, pamphlet paper um, is still considered one of the most important pieces of second wave feminist literature. Um, if you have a chance to read it, I highly recommend it. It is printed on pink paper and it is lovely. Um, not just because it's printed on pink paper. Um, so Judith's political and personal life was heavily documented um, and that included a 450 page FBI file, uh, which noted her interest in black power movements and the women's liberation. Um, and they said that she was someone to look out for. Um, she was also co-founder of the organization Chop, Chop, Stop Child Sexual Abuse, uh, which she founded in 1988 in Gainesville. She was also the founder of UF's first civil rights group, the Student Group. She was also the founder of the first Southern chapter of the National Women's Liberation Organization. Outside of her activism, she worked as an attorney defending child sexual abuse and human rights cases. One of her most well-known cases is her lawsuit against the independent Florida alligator, which occurred in 1976 and was the first case of sex-based discrimination brought to court here in Gainesville. Um, and as interesting as that case might sound, it is again an instance where um, there are no documents that pertain to that case, um, as frustrating as that sounds, it is. Um, it seems like, you know, you'd want to document uh, the first sex-based discrimination case that is brought to court here in the city, and yet uh, Caitlin and I both tried to find it and found nothing. Um, so yeah, the ignorance of history continues. And now we move to Vivian Feiler. Um, so Vivian is actually the only living member of the exhibit. Um, and she donated many of her own photographs and a lot of the information was taken directly from her because again, not a lot of information exists on these women. So it is uh, a great benefit that she is still living and still able to tell her own story to us. Um, so when she was about 15, her career as a storyteller began. Um, her teachers at Lincoln High School selected her to perform a 15 minute segment on WRUF radio to celebrate Black History Week. 
For over two decades since her church bought the property in 1995, Vivian has spearheaded the restoration of the Cotton Club. Um, it reopened to the public in early 2019 and continues as a sort of symbol of African-American greatness and life here in Gainesville. She worked as a nurse for much of her life and as a professor of nursing at Santa Fe Community College for over 27 years. She served as the chair of the healthcare committee for the Gainesville Women for Equal Rights. It was integral in the desegregation of the Alatra General Hospital after participating in a sit-in. Um, there is a lovely oral history that she does uh, where she explains how that sit-in operated. She, along with multiple other black women, basically sat in the black side of the, um, I believe it was like the clinic offshoot of the general hospital um, and waited. They just sat and waited to be cared. Um, it is a remarkable story of resilience um, and one, again, that is all too common. Um, outside of her activism and life as a nurse. She is also one third of an acapella group, the Washington Sisters, uh, where she sings alongside her sisters, Karen Washington Johnson and Sarah Washington Brown. And now to Clara Floyd Gehan right there in the corner. Um, Clara graduated from Gainesville High School in 1926 and went on to study at Brunel College in Georgia, where she studied political science and history before graduating in 1929. Before entering law school, she taught Latin here at Gainesville High School. In 1933, she became the first woman to graduate from the University of Florida College of Law and earned the Harrison Award for the highest overall grade point average. She worked at the firm Baxler and Clayton for over 10 years and argued all of their cases that went to the Florida Supreme Court. She was the first female lawyer in Gainesville after starting her practice in 1963. She, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Okay. Um, but she also worked to desegregate businesses uh, throughout the city of Gainesville as the chair of the Gainesville Advisory Biracial Committee. Go ahead. And she was one of four attorneys in Gainesville, and the others were had recently graduated from law school, so they're all of them, and who had started what was back then storefront legal aid mm -hmm. and became freelance legal services. Thank you, thank you. And now we will speak about Sarah Robb. Um, so Sarah initially worked as a nurse with her husband, Dr. Robert Lee Robb, um, and encouraged her to attend medical school because she had such a high level of skill as a nurse, despite her lack of training in a great deal of medical services. Um, but because of her gender, she was refused admission to medical schools in the United States and was forced to go to medical school in Germany. Um, she and her husband moved to Gainesville in 1883, uh, where she began working as a horse and buggy doctor, making house calls throughout the city of Gainesville and delivering babies as a midwife. Um, her work delivering children is really kind of the core of what she did here in Gainesville because it was considered sort of taboo for men to deliver babies um, and women more trusted women more to deliver their children. Um, it was also during this time in Gainesville that she and her husband established a small clinic with beds in the office of her home, uh, which you can visit today in the Rob House here in Gainesville. Uh, she and her husband, along with a family friend, published Rob and Co's Family Physician, a work on domestic medicines designed to show the causes, symptoms, and treatment of disease in, the 18, in 1880. Um, so this book detailed how to combine sort of traditional medical practices with a more holistic approach to medicine. Um, so she and her husband operated very differently when it came to medicine. Um, she was more of a traditional 
uh, doctor, whereas he was more interested in these more holistic approaches to medicine. Um, and you can actually read the book here, um, it's sitting on top of the display case if you're interested. Um, but outside of her medical career, she was also one of the founders of the Gainesville Garden Club, a member of the First Presbyterian Church Choir, and was known throughout town for her ability to tailor clothing. And now to the Marjories. Uh, so first uh, to Marjorie Kennan Rawlings, who's perhaps one of the most well-known figures in this exhibit. Um, so Marjorie was born in Washington, DC in 1896 and lives there for most of her childhood. Um, it was here that she began her writing career, uh, publishing letters and short stories in the Washington Post when she was just 14 years old. She mo moved to Florida in 1928 with her husband, Charles Rawlings, after purchasing a 72 acre farm in Cross Creek, Florida. Her love for Cross Creek drove her writing and her life. This love for the region came to a head in 1933 when she divorced her husband after he expressed his dissatisfaction with Cross Creek and Florida as a whole. Um, basically, from what I found, she was more willing to divorce her husband than leave Cross Creek. <laughs> Uh, Marjorie was inspired by the, the people, specifically the Cracker people and their landscape and the landscape of Cross Creek and began writing and documenting their stories. The business of moonshining, which she learned from a Cracker family, which she moved in with, would inspire her first novel, South Moon Under, which also sits in one of the display cases here. She was a close friend of fellow Florida legend Zora Neale Hurston following their first meeting in 1942. They would regularly meet with each other at Marjorie's home in Cross Creek or in San Augustine. Marjorie also volunteered as a submarine and plane spotter during World War II in an effort to serve alongside her second husband, Norton Baskin, who had been recently deployed. And now to Marjorie Harris Carr. They are different Marjories, but Marjories nonetheless. Uh, so Marjorie Harris Carr in 1932 began attending the Florida State College for Women and worked with the National Youth Administration in the summers to create a naturalist education program for children in Lee County. She graduated in 1936 with a bachelor's of science in zoology, but could not continue on to graduate school again because of her gender. Following graduation, she worked as a biologist at the Wallaca Fish Hatchery in, near the St. Johns River in North Central Florida. It was here that she became the first female wildlife technician in the state of Florida. It was also here where she met her husband, Archie Carr, who was working as a herpetologist. In 1957, she and the Gainesville Garden Club spearheaded the preservation of Payne's Prairie, which was to be destroyed and turned into a major highway. Her largest battle, however, was to prevent the construction of the Cross Florida Barge Canal in the 1960s, which was funded by President John F. Kennedy as a project for the Army Corps of Engineers. They launched the Save the Oklawaha movement along with protests and the Florida Defenders of the Environment formed during this time as well. Her work, along with the work of the Florida Department defenders of the environment, uh, prevented the construction of the Barge Canal and the land was renamed the Marjorie Harris Carr Cross Florida Greenway in her honor. Um, one of the most interesting parts of her sort of area in the exhibit is a letter from Lady Bird Johnson that was written to her. Um, and I find it fascinating that these two women of history, one obviously a little bit more well known than the other, um, were in conversation with each other about something that was happening right here in Gainesville. Um, and I think that just demonstrates how interconnected all of these women's lives were with sort of the grander narratives of women in this country. Um, but that concludes our sort of introduction to all of these women throughout the exhibit. But I hope you all leave here today sort of taking a piece of each of these women with you uh, to bring into your own life and into the lives of others. If you found yourself at all wanting more or want to, wanting to see more of yourself in this, in this space, I implore you to continue the work that has been started here and expand it. This, this exhibit is by no means complete. While I understand that not all of you are going to go home and create an exhibit or start your own museum, uh, this work can continue simply by talking to a friend, sharing on social media, any way that you can uh, to share about women who inspire you. Um, that is the purpose of this wall behind me. Um, this exhibit speaks to women who are 
known, well known in some cases, but that does not mean that those are the women that have impacted each of our lives. Um, so this space behind me is dedicated to remembering people that have impacted our lives in even small ways, whether that is our mothers, our professors, a doctor that cared for us for a short time. Um, it is dedicated to remembering those women that I could not speak to here today. Um, but no matter how you go about this work, I hope you find it as awe-inspiring as I have. Thank you. <laughs> and if anyone has any questions on um, sort of the exhibit process on the women, um, I will try to answer as best as I can. Yes. Um, Caitlin, do you remember where it was located? So, geography and map are not my forte. Mm -hmm. um, it was not located far from here. It was in the downtown area, but it's higher than the wall. Yes. 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 Just a small question. Yes. So, the map took me to the main area. Yes, yes. So the land for this was dedicated by Sarah um, after her husband passed away. So the museum is named in her honor rather than her husband's. Yes. Um, I believe that's a big question. There's a lot of things. Yes. Perfect. Uh, Dr. Moore would like to know if Judith's pamphlet is available as a download. Yes, her, her pamphlet is available online. Um, you can find it uh, both as a part of this exhibit on the exhibit website, um, but it's also located, I believe, in the Red Stockings archive. Um, if you just Google it, you will find it. Um, like I said, it's a very big piece of literature, um, so you can find it anywhere. Any other questions about anything at all? Happy to answer. Yes. Uh, I wasn't clear. Did you single handedly either over $100 million pen, or did you have, did you check with other people and have a committee that advised? <laughs> um, so, some of the initial work was, you know, me rethinking a lot of it. Um, Caitlin helped a great deal with just kind of helping me narrow it down because I think my, uh, desire was to speak about as many women as I could and Caitlin sort of reined me in a little bit like you can't talk about 50 women like even though that's shorter than 100 that's still too many um so she definitely helped a lot but a lot of it was me just sort of sitting with these women and thinking about which stories would not be the most general but speak to the most uh sort of experiences Yeah, so um, the sort of main exhibit text is available online, but a lot of it is still, you know, sort of something that I just have access to. I wrote a lot of things, um, but I can definitely talk to Caitlin about making all of that accessible online as well. Um, I don't know about a book. I, I'm still in college, just trying to write papers right now, but per possibly in the future. Yeah. Yes. Did you have a chance to talk to obviously our children, but other descendants who may have remembered these people as grandparents or great grandparents? Yeah. So I tried to reach out as much as I could. Um, a lot of the the work in terms of Marjorie Harris Carr uh, was done by the former director of the museum, Peggy McDonald. Um, so I relied on that a lot. Um, but I tried to reach out. Unfortunately, emails are very hard to track down, phone numbers. Um, so I, I, as of now, have not been able to speak to any of them uh, or their descendants personally, but I, I would really like to. It would help a lot, especially with the Buholtzes, just finding a photograph of her. Um, who knew that would be so difficult? Yes. 
this is for deaf and the, or the people on Zoom that might be helpful to repeat the question in the microphone. Okay. So I'm not sure they can hear as the question. I'm also transcribing them into the chat for the people on Zoom. Oh, okay. yes, if you'd like to do that as well. Okay. Anything else? Yes. I'll ask you your own question. Great. Who was the girl who was Thank you to my roommate. Um, <laughs> uh, so I wrote it here on the wall. She's here in this room today. Uh, the trailblazer in my life is definitely my mom. Um, I, it might sound a little cheesy, um, but we are incredibly similar down to our hair. She's in the back. If you see someone that looks like me, that's her um, or me, could be other. Um, but she has guided me throughout my entire life. Um, I don't think I would be even a little bit of who I am today or where I am today without her. Um, and all of the lessons she's taught me over the last 23 years, probably even before I was even alive, she was teaching me. That's how indebted I am to her. I'm not going to talk much longer because I can already see that she's crying. Mm -hmm. So we're going to keep it moving. Yes. Um, my question is, what was the most surprising thing that happened? Like, what was the most like, juicy? <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I think the kind of most surprising or juiciest thing I found was definitely the FBI file um, on Judith. Um, that and uh, it's also featured here sort of above the FBI file, um, but she was arrested at one point. Uh, well, she was arrested a few times, but one of the times that she was arrested, um, she drew sort of a map of the jail quarters. So those were also segregated for white women and black women. Um, and she drew what those sort of quarters looked like um, and how different women were treated differently um, despite being in the same place. Um, and that was interesting partially because it was fascinating that there's a woman in this exhibit that had been arrested a bunch of times. Um, but it's also fascinating that she had this sort of forethought to document everything that was happening in her life. Yes. Cool. <laughs>